my guest today is Professor Maria Castro, who is Professor of Neurosurgery and Professor of Cell and Development Biology at the University of Michigan Medical School. Her research program focuses on epigenetic regulation of cancer progression, uncovering the role of oncometabolites in the brain tumor microenvironment, and the development of new therapies for adult and pediatric glioma. Welcome, Maria. Thank you so much. Yeah, so as I, uh, as I briefly described, Maria, I don't have a deep knowledge of this. Uh, whatever I know in life sciences is by osmosis, um, by you know, dealing with doctors and pharmaceutical companies. Uh, but this is an area of great interest. Um, although in, in uh, big numbers, it might not be the, the biggest cancer. Um, sure. The, la the latest number I saw was about 25,000. Uh, in, in the, the US. US. Yeah. Correct. So I don't know if that scales to, I'm just guessing, 400,000 or so worldwide. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so close to half a million is the incidence rate uh, for brain cancer. Uh, and and the brain cancer is a very broad, very broad term. Uh, I know that WHO came out with some a new classification scheme around this. So before we get to brain cancer, uh, I want to get a definition of cancer. <laughs> what, what exactly is cancer? So cancer is when cells in our body uh, begin to divide without any control. So it's like uncontrolled growth. And this cancer then can not only become a large mass, it can, al it can also metastasize to distant places in the, the body. So essentially, it does not only disrupt and alter the place where the cancer started, but it can also disrupt and alter the function of very vital organs like the liver, you know, the spleen. Some cancers affect the blood. So essentially, it's a disease of the whole body, right? So it's uncontrolled growth, and this uncontrolled growth is mediated by genetic lesions or genetic mutations that arise during the lifespan. So all our cells, you know, have normal genetic material and due to exogenous things like, you know, sun in the case of the skin, what you eat in the case of the stomach and the intestines and, you know, some other exogenous uh, forces, UV rays, you know, the DNA can be altered and the, you know, the body has an, a very effective immune system that can eradicate these mutations. But sometimes these mutations evade the immune system and that's when a cancer arises. Yeah, so, so I don't know if I have a good understanding of this, uh, Maria. So um, is, it, is it a process? So you say it's a sort of uncontrolled growth of cells uh, and it could happen all around the body, sure. different, different organs and all of that. Um, I read somewhere, I don't know if I quite understand this, that it's sort of a cells going rogue, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, and, you know, if you rewind time back a few million years, you know, the, we had single cell organisms, which had probably localized objective function to, uh, to essentially survive. So is this, in this complex organism called human, is it this, um, these cells suddenly say, hey, I'm just going to look out for myself? Sure, you can think about it in that way. And the other way to think about it is that, you know, many times these cancer cells hijack the normal developmental pathways. And rather than become, you know, a terminal terminally differentiated cell that stops dividing, it goes back in development. They call it the Peter Pan syndrome. So it goes back, it, the clock goes back and these cells become like very young and actively dividing cells. And this is how the cancer can arise as well. This is mediated, can also be mediated by epigenetic mechanisms, which means, what does epigenetic means is there are mechanisms that are not mediated by genetic mutations, but they are mediated by other mechanisms, but also have very profound uh, implications in the way the cells behave. Right. So, so uh, brain cancer, uh, back to brain mm -hmm. cancer. Um, this is a very complex disease. Um, we don't want any foreign materials or stuff that's growing in your brain, uh, typically. 
Um, but uh, so, so the, say a little bit about there are the, the very different varieties of brain cancer, right? So I was thinking, you know, uh, from a physics perspective, there's space. So it's it's like which location is this incidence happening? There is time. How fast is it growing? Mm-hmm. And then there is sort of, you know, variety question. What variety is this particular cancer? Sure. And so, so what's our classification mechanism that WHO has come up with? And, you know, so what, what are you currently following? So the WHO has come up with a very recent classification. In 2021 is the latest classification. And the way these cancers are classified, I mean, we're talking about gliomas now, which are uh, tumors that arise in the central nervous system. They're classified by the presence of a single, single mutation. And this single mutation is, as it happens, in a metabolic enzyme, who knew? that a mutation in, it, in a metabolic enzyme was going to make such a huge impact in the way these cancers progress. So when the cancer has a mutation in this particular metabolic enzyme, this brain cancer is progresses much slower than if you have the wild type or the normal version of this metabolic enzyme. So this is the big classifier because it made such a huge difference in relation as to for how long the patients arrive. So I'll give you an example. If the glioma patients don't have that mutation and their median survival is approximately 18 months, so it's kind of a death sentence. If the patients, the gliomas have this particular mutation, the median survival is much, much longer. It can be anywhere between seven to 10 years. And the other feature, which is very interesting, is that the brain cancers that have this mutation appear in younger patients and usually you know they're overall in their all all their functions are in much better shape so these people survive longer but the tumor always comes back so in a way it's even more tragic because you have someone who's 40 years old in the you know plenitude of their lives and they have this tumor and they know you know that although the tumor progresses slower eventually this tumor is going to come back and kill them. So it's really, you know, there's a huge need for the development of novel treatment. So this is the big divide now, the ones that have the mutation in this metabolic enzyme and the tumors that don't. Yeah, so it's a, it's a probably a bit counterintuitive for general public. So in this case, the mutation is beneficial. If I understand correctly. Absolutely. Very counterintuitive. It's a big scientific question. So the big scientific question is why will a tumor acquire a mutation that delays its growth and allows the patient to live longer? But I think, you know, one can explain this is the work that we that we do in the lab. Like we can explain it as a an adaptation of, you know, if you think about, for example, a chronic infection. It's a way that the tumor cells found to survive longer because if they kill the patient quicker, the tumor cells will also die. I mean, disappear, right? So it's a, I think it's an evolutionary mechanism. And mm. this, the other interesting thing is that these particular tumor cells that have this mutation in this metabolic enzyme have gone back in development. So they have become more immature, if you yeah, yeah. want to. That's so interesting, Maria. So. In this COVID nineteen episode, uh, when when the you know so the virus uh, you know sort of uh, mutates and have different varieties, sure. Typically, those who keep the host alive longer uh, ultimately dominates. Uh, exactly. And so, so it's a sort of a similar process, right? Those are the ones that become pandemic, right? <laughs> the ones that kill the patients very quickly, like Ebola, never became a pandemic, right? Because it killed the patients so quickly, it remained very localized. Right, right. Very interesting analogy, absolutely. The, the same thing is happening in, in uh, cancer, you say. Um, and so, so, so going back to sort of the classification schemes here. So sure. uh, there is pediatric uh, cancer. I know that you do a lot of work. Yeah, we, we do work in pediatrics yeah. as well. Yeah, we have a... <clears throat> and then uh, WHO, uh, so the recent uh, thing is about one, two, three, and four sort of different sure. cancer. 
And uh, so, 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 you know, say a little bit about what's the difference between pediatric, so pediatric meaning less than 15 in age, or? Yeah, so the tumors arise also within the central nervous system in the brain, yeah. and they can have several locations in the pediatric population. And again, deadly disease is really devastating. The most aggressive are the tumors that grow in the brainstem, which is the part of the brain that connect the main brain with the spinal cord. And what happens with those tumors is that they cannot be <clears throat> surgically resected because that is a very crucial area. So you yeah. can't cut into it because otherwise you kill the patient. So these tumors are a death sentence and the kids that are have these cancers will die within nine to 12 months. So essentially it's the most aggressive of all the brain cancers. We also work on another particular pediatric brain cancer that arises in the cortex, so in the frontal part of the brain. And those are also lethal. The median survival is a little longer, maybe 15 months. The kids are a little older. The ones that I talked to you about the brainstem are the youngest kids, can be anywhere between, you know, under a year old to three to five years old. The ones that arise in the frontal part of the brain, it's more, ad more adolescents, but again, the median survival is around 15 months and they're always lethal. So, and the other, the other problem with these tumors is that, you know, one of the main treatment modalities is radiation. So in the adult population, radiation doesn't have such devastating adverse side effects, whilst in the pediatric population it has. Because, you know, in the pediatric brain, you have developmental processes going on and radiation really impact those processes. So the kids that there are some kids that may survive. There are some more benign brain cancers that all, are also treated with radiation. And those kids have very severe behavioral and cognitive impairment. So it's really a very big problem. It's a big problem. So the, the usual suspects in a disease um incidents are genetic sure uh, and vinyl factors as you say epigenetics um sure uh, dietary and uh, behavioral factors so i would imagine is it is it true to think about it this way that um pe pediatric brain cancer is more genetic driven that's not the case pediatrics brain what you say is really very like interesting because there are some cancers for which, you know, the environmental impact on cancer progression is totally demonstrated. Like for example, melanoma, totally directly related with sun exposure, right? Or for example, stomach cancer, the type of foods you eat, you know, the Japanese population has a very high incidence of stomach cancer and that's because of how they cook their food in their walks with oil that has been yeah. heated and reheated. Right, so there's some cancers for which, or lung cancer related with smoking or with air pollution, or um, there's this other one that is related with asbestos in the buildings. Interestingly, brain cancer has never been correlated with any outside factors. It's 100% genetically mediated. So there are mutations that arise in the cells that then give rise to that cancer. So, so that means that it's really predictable in many ways. It's totally, no, you can't predict. The problem with brain cancer and why it is such a deadly disease, it, it's, there is no way to do early diagnostics, right? If you have melanoma, if you go to your yearly uh, checkup for your skin, then the doctor, your dermatologist will find, you know, the the lesion, the, it can be excised, your cure. Breast, the same, right? You do the mammogram. Uh, the other one that is pretty well controlled is a colon cancer. You go your colonoscopy, you remove the polyp, you're cured as well. So I think the main thing with brain cancers is that there are no uh, techniques for early diagnosis. So when either an adult patient or a pediatric patient comes to the doctor, the tumor is already huge and sometimes it has invaded the whole brain. So it's it's now thought about as a disseminated brain disease because you know you not only have the tumor mass, which is what the surgeons can remove, but the tumor cells have already spread out throughout the brain, and that's why these diseases become incurable. Yeah. So, so let me see if I understand this, uh, Maria. So, so if genetics is a big component sure. of 
pediatric brain cancers, then uh, we can look back and look at the history, right? A and say, what's the probability that a kid could actually have it? Wouldn't they? I mean, from historical data? It, it's impossible because there's no way you can predict, you cannot predict it. You know, it can appear at any, there's, there's no, you know, there's no predisposition. Like for example, breast, if in your family you have the BRCA mutation, you can predict that there's going to be a very high incidence or possibility of that person getting cancer, both breast cancer or other gynecological cancers. In breast, there's no prediction, impossible. Yeah. So that's why, that's what makes it such a challenging disease. And also, in addition to that, as you said it at the beginning of the recording, you know, because the cancer is not as huge in terms of numbers as lung or prostate or breast, the pharmaceutical companies are not interested in developing novel therapeutics. So that that's why the calling is for us academics, right? <laughs> All the brain cancer research and the therapeutic developments are pursued at academic institutions or non-for-profit research uh, institutes. But that, that's another really challenge that we have because it's very, very difficult to get funding. And if you look at all the advocacy groups and, you know, the parents and the families, they all do a lot of work trying to raise the awareness to get funding from the government to really move the needle, right? Because for the interestingly and very sadly, this the outcome or the prognosis of this disease has not changed for the last 40 years. It remains yeah, the that's same. What I was ask you, yeah. <laughs> right? right? Yeah. Which is really frustrating because if you think about the enormous scientific progress that has been made for other yeah. cancers, you know, the genome project. CRISPR-Cas9, genome editing, and still this disease remains as said deadly today as it was 40 years ago. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's disappointing. Um, so, so glioblastoma, um, we have some famous people who succumbed to sure. it uh, in the last few years. And um, what's the incidence rate of glioblastoma in the U.S.? It's approximately you have 25,000 new cases every year yeah. and the median age is around 60 years old. So glioblastoma is, you know, 60 years old. Pediatric brain cancers are, you know, in the pediatric population. Pediatrics consider anything from 21 years old to birth. And interestingly and really very devastating is that now Pediatric brain cancer is the leading cause of death in the pediatric population. I mean, it superseded leukemias, it superseded all other cancers. Oh, wow. Yeah, so, it's so really, what, what? really, because again, you know, the other cancers, leukemias, where you have a lot of people with a disease, a lot of progress, the disease is now, you know, controlled. You can live, some people are, a lot of people are cured, others can live with, you know, long-term maintenance uh, drugs. Whilst for brain cancer, as I said earlier, nothing has moved that needle. So th that is uh, that's quite striking. So very. So so wh why is pediatric um, brain cancer? So can I assume that it's on the rise in the U.S.? I wouldn't. There's a lot of work being done in that area. I wouldn't say it's on the rise. I think people are becoming much more aware and the families are being becoming much more, you know, they're advocating, they're going to Capitol Hill, they are requesting their senators. I mean, something needs to be done. There's a worldwide phenomena where people are really, really wanting solutions. And I, it's true. It's a, it's a voiceless population, right? Yeah. Children have no voice, so they need the families and the parents to really advocate for them. And I think it's happening. I would say within the last 10 years, major difference. I mean, people are running marathons. People are, it, it's incredible what you see, what people are doing and how that is changing the, the field, right? Because there, now there's a lot more, like I didn't used to work in pediatric brain cancer. And the reason why 
I be, our team became interested is because again, patients, you know, there was a family here in Michigan whose child had a, a pediatric high grade glioma and the child had died and the parents came to see us. And, you know, they were the ones that convinced us to do something because no one is doing anything. So, you know, that yeah. shows the importance of advocacy and family families involvement. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the issues, right? The incidence rates are lower in the grand scheme of things, but then when the incidence happens, it's catastrophic. Uh, catastrophic, it, it, it's exactly. It's catastrophic for the patient. It's catastrophic for the for the family. Families, sure. Um, and, and often it's catastrophic for society in many ways. So sure, sure. It, right? so, so, so let me go back to... Um, so, so what is our sort of treatment modalities currently? I mean, we have gone through so, a lot of different things, yeah. Sure. The, so the current treatment modalities are surgery, which is you do need surgery because surgery removes the tumor mass. So it really debulks, that takes a huge mass from inside the brain. So it's absolutely critical. And it's been proven that the more that, you resect of the tumor, the better the outcome for the patients. The problem with the brain is that sometimes it's in locations where you can't cut a lot and sometimes not, you can't even remove the whole tumor. So that's the problem with the brain, right? Because it controls so many vital functions, you have to be very careful. But when the tumor can be totally removed, completely resected, or at least with this, what the surgeon sees, the outcome of the patients is much better. So surgery is number one. Radiation therapy is number two, which also alleviates a lot of the symptoms, although it's not curative. And some chemotherapies. Now, our team is now developing a novel approach, which is mediated in the immune system. If you remember what I told you earlier, the tumors are, are not a mass, right? By the time yeah. the surgeon removes them, there's cells that have migrated throughout the brain. So what we thought is that you really need to harness the power of the immune system, why? Because the immune cells are kind of like little sentinels of the body and they can reach everywhere. So if you can train the immune system to recognize the tumor and kill it, then we will have a much better chance of moving that needle, right? So our team has developed a novel approach which is called immune-mediated gene therapy. So we use um, modified viruses that from which we have taken out all the pathogenic genes, all the genes that cause disease, and we've inserted genes that are therapeutic. So now what we what we did is we first implemented this approach in adult patients. So we have two viruses, one which we call the killer virus. It has a gene that can kill actively dividing, proliferating tumor cells, the other virus has a gene that trains the immune system to recognize the cancer cells. So we deliver the two, virus, two viruses into either the remnant tumor or into the tumor cavity. The immune system will be trained and we have demonstrated that you have your immune cells, which are your the, the classical cells that will kill tumor cells are called CD8 T cells or cytotoxic T cells. They come back, they can migrate back into the tumor and they can eliminate any remnant tumors. And the other thing that we have demonstrated with this approach is that those T cells have memory. So when the tumor comes back, they reawaken and they can go back and kill the tumor that is trying to grow again. And we've just published a a big paper that appeared in the Lancet Oncology where we've tested this approach in uh, adult patients because, you know, in the pediatric population, you can't go straight to implement a novel approach in children. You have to first test the safety in adult patients. So we tested it in adult high-grade glioma patients, and now we are preparing to implement that, the same approach in the pediatric population. So, you know, the field is moving. The, the issue is that it moves too slowly. You know, you have all the, you have, the, I think there's another issue in this field, not only applies to gliomas, but in cancer in general and in clinical trials that the red tape is huge. You know, you have to so much paperwork to get anything from the lab into the clinic. It takes years. 
So that really delays, you know, progress. But that's what it is. We have to, yes. <laughs> you know, battle it. But so it's taken, you know, the, the adult clinical trial took in the making 20 years between the concept, right? right? Testing it in the lab, doing all the paperwork, get the approval from the FDA and then running the clinical trial to completion, the whole thing to, took 20 years. Now we're exactly. ready to implement it in children. But you know, we're doing it. So <laughs> yeah, hopefully, hopefully we start using computers. Uh, sure. Like um, so the so the, this is really a fascinating direction. I saw some something from Duke Maria. Um, that they introduced the polio virus sure. into the brain, and um, and we, we have a couple of very interesting uh, cases where things have been okay. So this is sort of a very very exciting direction, right? So the, the issue sure. with the brain cancer, if I understand correctly, is that the immune system has sort of left it. It doesn't really. Um, get it, <laughs> it doesn't attach to it. And so the, the goal here is to sort of wake up the immune system. Exactly. To go attack it, right? That's the, that's the idea? Yeah. That's the idea, because the problem is, you know, the cancers are really intelligent, if you will, entities, right? Because in order to be able to grow, they have to trick the immune system. So they become stealth, you know, they just run under the radar of the immune system. And to do that, they create a very highly suppressive microenvironment, right? So what we need to do is reawaken the immune system so now the immune cells can really recognize and fight that cancer. So the immune cells that are resident within the tumor mass are very, very immune suppressed, so they just can't work anymore. So essentially, you have to reawaken the immune system that, you know, the immune system gets formed all the time in the bone marrow. So it's a very dynamic system. So you have to devise a way by which you can reawaken the immune system so it can now overcome immune suppression and recognize the cancer. Yeah, sure. So is, it, is it right to think about this, Maria? I, I know nothing about this. So the, the immune system doesn't think there is anything wrong. Um, exactly. Where the cancer is, uh, you know, brain or any other organ, and then the cancer has sort of free reign to whatever it wants to do. So the immune system doesn't quite know something bad is happening. Is that the way mm -hmm. to think of it? That's exactly what's happening. So the the tumor cells via epigenetic mechanisms can really modify the immune cells, right? Because the immune cells, that's where you where the epigenetics come into place. The immune cells are not mutated. What's mutated is the cancer. So the cancer is mutated and via these epigenetic mechanisms, sec secretes molecules or substances into the circulation that really makes the immune system suppresses its function. And that's how the cancer can continue to grow. So what we need to do is to bypass that immune suppression and really reawaken the immune system and that there's ways of doing it so as you mentioned you know the duke team had one approach we have a different approach you know there's a there's this this um, new technology which is called gene therapy by which you can use viral vectors as many types of viral vectors you can use the poliovirus we use adenovirus some other people are using herpes viruses similar concept by different viruses which you can genetically engineer to encode now therapies within the virus that then can do can reawaken the immune system or kill the tumors there's many ways in which you can do it and different teams are pursuing different avenues so you know it's like chemotherapeutic drugs there's many different types right and different companies and different teams pursue different different targets and you know we'll see which one works better <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah i mean that's the beauty of it right so sure. uh, i mean the, uh, from a platform technology perspective this seems like a very interesting direction right so you take a viral dna you can modify it sure so that it's not going to replicate um 
and give you a disease. And, um, and then introduce that to areas that the immune system has ignored, so to speak. Sure. And, and let it attack it, right? I mean, we could, it's just not brain cancer. We could do this in a lot of different areas, I would imagine. Sure. It's been tried for different types, many types of cancers and for many diseases, right? So gene therapy is a technology that, again, arose several years ago now. And for some diseases, you know, it's now standard of care. It's been used to treat patients. So hopefully, you know, it will, for cancer, not yet. So it's not a therapy that it's in more of the testing stage. So we hope that maybe within the next five years, we'll come up with a therapy that can now become, you know, FDA approved to treat patients with different cancers. But the technology that I was describing to you earlier can be used to treat all kinds of solid cancers, breast, prostate, lung, because the principles apply to all cancers, right? You need to kill the cells, the cancer cells, and you need to train the immune system. All the cancers have very similar mechanisms to trick the immune system. So the immune system does not think there's a foreign body growing within, you know, a person, for example. Yeah, I saw some study that said that if you have allergies, like eczema or, you know, just general allergies, that myself and my daughter have, your sure. chance of getting, the chance of getting brain cancer is very low. Uh, in, in some sense, uh, so at the end of the day, it's how active your immune system is, right? I mean, it goes both ways. So sure. COVID-19, the, the long COVID issues that we dealt with is sort of an overactive immune system. Exactly. Um, so you have to sort of in the, in the right. Be fine-tuned, sure. <laughs> Overreactive immune system can cause, you know, all kinds of diseases like autoimmune diseases, you know, multiple sclerosis, allergies, psoriasis, and an underreactive immune system is makes you very prone to cancers or chronic infections, right? Sure. Yeah, sort of an optimization problem. So do you think that I know at some point we can design something that sort of optimizes the immune system to be right on the night? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> the immune system has millions of years of evolution of advantage <laughs> in relation to us, right? So I think may be possible. The thing is that you have to devise a different, you know, different strategy for each application, right? So multiple sclerosis, people are trying to quench the effect of C. In this case, they think it could be the B cells or it could be the CD4 T cells or the CD8 T cells. So there's many different ways in which you can attack or modify or fine tune the immune system, but every different disease or situation will require different technologies. So cancer is very particular because you want to stimulate it. The other interesting thing, I'm sure you've seen it in TV when you go to the movie theaters, you've heard of immune checkpoint blockade, right? Like now everybody's talking about it, it's in the newspapers. So what happens is that, you know, it's what I was telling you about the cancers. The cancers have developed mechanisms by which they can really completely block the immune system. And that is called, those are called immune checkpoints. So essentially you need to block those immune checkpoints so that now the cells can become functional again. Those that received the Nobel Prize a few years ago now, and they're now being used to treat melanoma very successfully. And I think also some of the liquid cancers and probably some other solid cancers, breast and lung, right? So they're not completely curative, but they really prolong survival. So, you know, there's been successful instances in which, you know, by genetically engineered approaches or antibodies, the immune system could be fine-tuned. <clears throat> I quite like this, Mary. I, I quite like this immunotherapy uh, approach to it. It's a bit like all the coughs are, you know, sitting around and drinking coffee. Sure. And, uh, you know, if you can get them out of the out of the office and go, you know, say there's a problem, <laughs> go, go look at it. Uh, is 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 very elegant way to solve a problem that chemical 
groups, right? So, uh, but it, it's it's easier said than done, I would imagine, for most diseases. Sure, our thought, our thoughts is that without tackling the immune system, the can it will be very difficult to cure, right? Because any approach that kills, you know, the other interesting thing is that the as I said, the cancer has evolved many mechanisms to overcome a lot of the control mechanisms that control their growth, right? So there was an instance where people thought, oh, the cancer is overexpressing the epidermal growth factor receptor. So if we block that growth factor receptor, there's chemicals or antibodies, we'll be able to cure the cancer. The cancer will not be able to grow anymore. As it happened to be, a lot of other uh, mechanisms bypass that growth. It's, think about it like the tube in London or the subway in New York, right? You can block, if you block one station, you can still get to many of the other stations by, you know, yeah. routes that will bypass that particular station. The same with cancer, right? So you can block one pathway with a drug or a, you know, a particular antibody that blocks a receptor on the surface of the cancer cell. And people thought, you know, that, that happened maybe 10 or 15 years ago. If we block that growth pathway, the cancer is going to stop growing. We're going to kill it. We're going to cure the patients. That was not the case because what happened is that it's what you call development of resistance. The cancer cells adapt to the new environment and they stop using that pathway, but they use other pathways. So it's really a very challenging, very, very challenging, uh, you know, disease. So what the current now or the, the thought process now is that you will be now, we will need to use combination therapies. So talking about radiation, chemotherapies that block different pathways, or gene therapy that blocks the immune system. But one single approach is not going to be, not going to do it. Yeah, so let me let me ask you this. So chemotherapy and radiation therapy appear sure. very inelegant. <laughs> I'm an engineer, so I, I, I don't know a lot about life sciences. Um, it seems sort of a hammer rather than a you know fine scapel. You know. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, and so but immunotherapy is 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 a systemic ability to to cure something, right? So 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 can we invest more into it? I mean, where are we? I mean, are are we really focusing on it as a way to cure diseases? Oh, sure. It's interesting what you say, because now there's a lot of research, very recent, some coming out from our team and research from other teams, that now shows that radiotherapy, although, and some chemotherapeutic approaches, although they were thought about as being a sledgehammer, what they can also do is they can stimulate the immune system, because when the, you know, radiotherapy impacts the duplication of the DNA. So yeah. essentially, radiotherapy will kill cells that are actively divided because dividing because it, you know, interferes with the DNA replication, right? But in doing that, the cells will release is what you call immunogenic cell death. It will release molecules that can really stimulate the innate immune system. It's the innate immune system is the the first line of defense so it's like an early type of immune response and that immune response is stimulated by the for example radiotherapy or some chemotherapeutic agents so people are rethinking about what's the impact or the power of radiotherapy and now people are thinking that the key is now combined radiotherapy which stimulates one branch of the immune system, which is probably the inflammatory branch, doesn't elicit T cells, but the inflammatory, the inflammatory uh, kind of sequence of events really helps in maximizing the immune response that involves T cells. So this is very kind of recent research, I would say within the past five to 10 years, very, very recent. So people are trying to harness that side of radiotherapy to combine it with other approaches so that the immune system can be better equipped. Yeah. Which is very interesting. 
Yeah, so technology, Maria, I, I could understand this. So this sort of an electrical and magnetic sure. uh, thing that you wear, you know, so if you can sort of uh, get to the cancer electrically and magnetically, you can stop them from replicating, you can kill them. Uh, where are we on that? that particular? Yeah, so that's a kind of, that technology is being used by some in some centers. So the principle of that approach is, is as follows. It is thought that the cancer cells can be fostered to replicate by impulses from either glial cells or neuronal cells or electrical impulses. So if we can disrupt that, you can control tumor growth. The issue is that that approach will never be curative. It will maybe delay progression, right? But it's not a curative approach. So that's one strategy. The other strategy that's been implemented in some centers, but then again, it's experimental, is a ultrasound to disrupt the blood-brain mm. barrier. Because that, the other issue with cancer, brain cancer is that, you know, it is protected, the brain is protected by the blood-brain barrier. So most of the chemotherapeutic drugs do not permeate, do not get to yeah. the tumor. So that's, you know, that's why in many metastatic cancers, like for example, breast or prostate, they call the brain is the ultimate frontier because once the cancer gets to the brain, it's the death sentence, right? Because there's no chemotherapeutic that can really reach it. So some, some research teams are using ultrasound to break the blood-brain barrier on a temporal basis, deliver the chemotherapeutic agent and see if that can make the, these chemotherapeutic drugs reach the tumor and really be more effective in delaying progression. So there's a lot of uh, new developments, yeah. devices, and the other the other area that we have done uh, quite a bit of work on is uh, nanomedicine, which is using uh, nanoparticles to encapsulate the chemotherapeutic agents, or you can encapsulate DNA or antibodies. And these uh, nanoparticles can be decorated with uh, some compounds that will act as, you know, like a missile. So you inject them into the blood and they will find the tumor. And we've had, we have had some very good results in experimental models. So that's an approach that is also, you know, people are working. There's a lot of work in that area as well. So there's many ways, you know, in which one could think of tackling the disease, yeah. but yeah, I mean, still some ways as, as to go. Said, um, the numbers have been sort of pessimistic um, in the grand scheme. Very, state. sure. Um, but we have a lot of technologies now. We can uh, we can try to try to use them. Um, but uh, glio, uh, what is it, blastoma? Glioblastoma. Glioblastoma, yeah. So I want to I want to sort of finish up with that. Um, this is sort of sort of the worst disease in some sense, right? I sure. Mean, um, we have famous people who succumb to it. Um, we have a lot of people succumbing to it. Sure. And we haven't had a way to slow it down or anything, right? In some some sense. Glioblastoma. It's been a deadly disease for many, many years. And as you mentioned earlier, very prominent people have died of it. So it means that, you know, it can impact anyone, you know, from any socioeconomic status, any country. So there's no way you can protect you. You can't say, oh, okay, if I have a healthy diet, I won't get it. If, you know, I go to my regular che checkups, I know I won't get it. No, <laughs> you know, that will not spare you. So essentially anyone can get it. As I said, glioblastoma will, the median age of survival is around 60, so impacts a little bit of the older population. And for the past 30 to 40 years, there's been no progress in terms of improving the prognosis of the disease. What has been improving is the, diag the imaging technologies, right? So now if a patient goes in with a brain cancer, to the doctor, the imaging technologies are much better, so it's much more accurate. The surgeons can do a much better job at excising the tumor. So there's a lot of improvements. Also, there's a so new development. A, 
Yeah. So, sorry, Maria. So they just CAT scan an MRI. Is that sure, absolutely. So you can see, you know, you can do it at the beginning when the tumor first arose and the the patient went to the doctor. So you can really diagnose diagnose them really very, very well. You can even determine if they are the ones that are more benign because they have that mutation in the metabolic enzyme. So these patients have a much longer survival or if it, there's going to be the more aggressive type, which are the ones that have, they don't have that mutation. So there's a lot. You know, there's a lot of improvements. The other thing for which there have been improvements is to detect when the tumor is coming back. There's imaging methods that will allow you, you know, the patients will go to the doctor to get their checkups. And if the tumor is coming back, depending where it's coming back and in which form, it can be removed again. So there's been improvement. There's also been a lot of improvement in the device arena. So there's a convection enhanced delivery by which you know, there's a catheter that is implanted into the brain tumor area and you can deliver chemotherapeutics directly into the tumor cavity. So there's a lot of efforts and I would say the quality of life of the patients is better today yeah. than what it was 40 years ago. Radiation alleviates a lot of the symptoms. So, you know, there's a lot that can be done. Also, there's awake craniotomies by which this is kind of seems like science fiction, the patients are awake whilst the doctor removes the tumor. And, you know, there's been cases where here at the university and many other centers, you, you need a center of high complexity. But for example, if the patient says, well, I'm a, you know, I play the flute or I do X, Y, Z, and I would not want to lose that. Yeah. The patient is asked to do it whilst the surgeon is removing their brain tumor. So it's really <laughs> amazing, right? The technology in that sense has really made impressive a uh, progress. Yeah, so, so we'll, we'll, we'll there's a lot of positives. This. Yeah, we finish up with this, Maria. So, so one thing I was wondering about is um, when the cancer happens, um, is the cancer using the existing cells in the brain? So, so if I go in and remove the cancer, am I removing part of the brain or am I removing sure. just the cancer? No, you're, that's a very interesting point because the cancer arises in normal brain cells. When the normal brain cells become cancerous, they're not normal anymore, right? So they're not part of the normal circuitry of the brain. You know, the brain controls everything, every yeah. function that you can think of, even cognitive or emotional uh, status, it's all controlled by the brain. That's find it a very fascinating <laughs> organ, right? So when the cells become cancerous, they stop being normal brain cells. So the normal circuitry in a way is interrupted. That's why you can remove that tumor and brain function is normally quite preserved. The other interesting thing is that there is a lot of redundancy in the brain. Yeah. So although sometimes when the surgeon removes the tumor, there can be some impairment in some kind of either cognitive and or functional uh, properties of the of the patient this can be recovered with there's a lot of now that's the other area in which there's been a lot of progress in terms of the it's called the holistic treatment of the patient and again in the centers of high complexity now it's not only the surgeon the one that treats the patients but you have psych psychologists you have you know psycho all kinds of, you know, doctors that have to do with function, with movement, etc. So it's a very holistic approach, which I think is really, really good. Yeah. So, but redundancy is different for different functions. I would imagine, right? Like sight, for example. Sure, sight or like dexterity. Usually, function is very well preserved. You know, people. There's, you know, that in that area, there's been a lot of progress. There's been, you know, you can do mapping, you can do circuitry in situ, in vivo, in the real time. So it's the surgeries are done in a very, very safe way now. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, in that area, there's been huge progress. We have to keep going. Um, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> we don't see a um, lot of improvement in the numbers in aggregate. I mean, the lifespan of Americans fell by two years. Ah, absolutely. Uh, um, and uh, although technology is evolving and developing, we have a lot more challenges, I think. So 
it's about research. I would say it's about funding for research. Mm-hmm. We have we have to keep going. I mean, we, we're going to have setbacks, but if if uh, folks like you, you know, keep keep going, sure. research, we'll find something interesting. And I also think it's a lot about you know general vigilance from the. I think it's education because a lot, like for example, during COVID, a lot of the people stopped going to their regular mammograms checkups. Yeah. Have, and that really, that's really what caused a lot of setbacks in terms of the lifespan of the population. And the same applies for cancer. There's a very interesting notion that, you know, one of the main symptoms of brain cancer is a, an epileptic attack or an epileptic fit. And sometimes it happens that an incidental epileptic fit gives rise to that diagnostic of a brain cancer. The patient didn't come to oh, the wow. doctor because they had a brain cancer. They had, yeah. And usually that can happen in sometimes in younger patients. And those patients, because the tumors are could be small, they do much better. And there's another example that I really found very fascinating. There was this clinical trial in the, a pediatric population, and we got a case report of a, the clinician that was involved in this trial, it was an MRI. So it was imaging the brain of infants from birth or one year old until adulthood. And in this particular child, they found an image that was abnormal when the child was three years old. Yeah. And But the child had no symptoms and the doctors decided, okay, we're gonna, it was in the brain stem, so it couldn't be surgically removed. That essentially like, 15 or 16 years later turned out to be a tumor, which that what that is telling us is that these tumors arise very early on. And, you know, if we could have an early diagnostic way of finding out, depending on the location, they could be cured because it means that the tumors will not have the opportunity to invade the whole brain right now because there's no early diagnostics. The, the brain is totally invaded by tumor cells. And you couldn't think, you know, the brain is not an organ that you can, you can do MRIs on the population, right? Yeah. Mammograms, you can do it at the population level, colonoscopies, population level, melanoma I screening. I wouldn't come up with a program to do it, you know. It might happen. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem. We can't scan <laughs> brains at the population level. That's why... We can't do early diagnostics of these cancers. So that's, so that's an area where we should invest a lot because if we could do that, that would make a huge impact in survival. Diagnostics and preventative uh, exactly. intervention is what humans should really focus on. Sure. Um, but I don't know if our policymakers and our politicians <laughs> really, really have a good understanding. Sure. Excellent, Maria. This has been great. Thanks so much for spending time with me. Thank you so much. All the best. Thank you. Bye. Bye.